Professor Ilona Kickbush, thank you so much for joining us from uh, Switzerland. If you just look at uh, the recent developments, so whether it's the UN, WHO, world leaders, both from Europe, the European Commission, of course, no US, South Africa as well, when they looked at uh, funding $8 billion to accelerate the development of a vaccine for the coronavirus, what's your reading of that? How important that itself is in a step and the fact that they're saying it should be accessible to all? Well, I think uh, there are several things here that we need to look at. First of all, we all know that we want a vaccine. And therefore, the vaccine development, the cooperation and the money for that is absolutely essential. And I might add also an issue that's very important for India is the diagnostics, the testing technology, which is also part of this. So it's trying to bring together funding and uh, to move that forward. So that's absolutely critical. I think the second point that's really critical is to give that message, we need WHO, we support WHO. And all the statements from those heads of state and also from business, uh, from foundations clearly said, you know, we support WHO, we fund WHO, we want to move forward together with WHO in global solidarity. And I think the third thing is to analyze very carefully who was on that call. And of course, you very clearly saw that practically all major funders of WHO, except the United States and Japan, were on that call. And that is quite extraordinary. And of course, the next step, as you know, is going to be a big fundraiser by the European Union uh, on the 4th of May to move forward to achieve that 8 uh, billion goal. So it's a very, very important global signal to say, you know, we will move ahead. And if some countries don't want to, then, you know, bad luck, but we're not going to have them stop the need for global solidarity in this context. Just picking up from that last point, when you're saying countries were not part of that, we've seen to an extent what seems like a U.S. backpedaling of sorts, if it can be read like that. Secretary Pompeo reportedly telling the National Security Council that uh, seven countries, whether it's Syria, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Sudan, uh, that funding should not be halted in those cases. How, what's your reading of the whole U.S. position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the WHO? Well, from the start, it was political positioning. You know, there was no analyses there. I think some of the people who took this decision don't even really know what WHO does, point one. And point two, what the U.S. money does in the context of WHO. So, of course, there's the assess contribution that contribute to a whole number of WHO programs. But the really critical thing, of course, are the voluntary contributions by the USA. And those go mainly to immunization programs, to polio programs and uh, matters like that. They help save children. So I think as they started an analysis and as they got the figures and, you know, 10, uh, no, excuse me, 100 uh, US-based civil society organizations who are active in global health wrote to the president and said, do you actually know where you're capping the money? So I think there is a learning process going on and we'll see where that leads us to. Professor, when you're talking about global leadership and we've seen that lacking of sorts, uh, whether it's at the U United Nations Security Council, again, as you're pointing out, it's geopolitics uh, playing out there. Uh, the WHO, now you've seen uh, another global attempt at raising money. What do you think of, uh, say, the blame game that is being played out against the WHO? Australia stepping in, saying, uh, proposing that there should be inspectors allowed into uh, various countries during a health crisis. Now, that's something that's probably not practical, considering, one, that even if the WHO rules or the IHR uh, was basically framed or agreed to by the US and would they agree or would every country agree to elect inspectors in in such a situation? 
Well, I think the point that you raised is very important that WHO doesn't just act, it acts according to a rule book, the international health regulations, and those, yes, were negotiated by the member states, including the United States and Australia. And yes, they were very strong in the negotiations. I was present then to make sure that WHO can't impinge on their sovereignty. So it's very interesting to see one of the countries that was one of the toughest negotiators at the time to say, yes, now we want a system within the IHR possibly that allows the WHO or the United Nations, or for that matter, it could be the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board to do exactly that. Now, of course, I always have a feeling when some countries suggest that, you know, just like the inspectors that go into Iran or etc., you have a couple of countries in your perspective, you know, you want to send someone to China, but you might not be that open to have that inspector come into your own country. We know that from the human rights inspections, for example. So I personally would be totally in favor of such an inspector's uh, approach, but it means for all countries, point one. Point two, it really has to be, you know, independent. And point three, of course, uh, it uh, has to be accepted then because, you know, it's all very good having a report from uh, an inspector, but what follows, you know, will there be incentives? Will there be sanctions? There's a whole stream of other issues that are linked to this. And I think, yes, we should discuss that. I might add one thing, if I may, the Australian proposal sounds a little bit as if there were no accountability structures, which is not true. You know, after each public health emergency of international concern, there is an analysis. I was part of the analysis after the Ebola crisis. Uh, the program, the w new WHO emergency program, has an oversight committee that analyzes what it does. And of course, the governing bodies of WHO, the Executive Council, the uh, World Health Assembly also provide oversight. So it's not that we have no oversight, it's that we need an oversight with teeth. And I think that's the issue at stake and applied to all, exclamation mark. When you're talking about accountability and you, you mentioned the Ebola, uh, post Ebola what happened and the WHO was found wanting in that case, when you look at calls for whether it's national or international reviews of how countries have countries or international organizations have dealt with the situation, is the GPMB, which you are part of, also possibly one forum where that could happen? We definitely will have to do that. We're actually in the process of discussing what our next report should focus on. You know that our September report, World at Risk, told everybody at the United Nations there's a pandemic coming and nobody wanted to listen. Uh, the IHR has conditionalities which help countries be prepared and nobody prepared properly. And then you have the problem that even countries that did have an infrastructure for preparedness, meaning the United States and the UK, were then in a situation that the political decisions that were taken were actually not supportive of a good preparedness infrastructure and response. So I do think, yes, our GPMB could play a very important role. Also, because if you look at the membership, there's a broad membership. There's a membership from the United States. I might add Dr. Fauci is a member of the GPMB. We have the head of China CDC as a member of the GPMB. Dr. Brundtland, the former director general, is one of the chairs. So I think it's a very prestigious group that could actually help take the conversation forward. And again, when you're, uh, you have been described as the Angela Merkel of health policy. If I can just get your views on how Germany has been handling it. We, we saw that famous uh, video of hers where she was so cool, calm, scientific, logical, and empathetic when she was explaining the whole situation and why there was a need for the policies that were being followed. In your view, how has uh, Germany been handling the, the crisis? Because it's been portrayed as one of those role model countries? 
Well, Germany started earlier than other countries, and uh, it had, of course, a very good health infrastructure that it yeah. could build on. It took political decisions. We have a very strong health minister, Jens Spahn, who was able to convince, and that's important in Germany because it's a decentralized country, so you always have to convince all the uh, lender, uh, all the provinces or whatever you would call it in India. And uh, then, of course, the chancellor did take the decision that uh, she would be a public face of the government action. Usually, Angela Merkel stays very much in the background. She's often criticized for that. Remember the refugee crises. Mm -hmm. But this time, she really moved to the fore, I think also because she is a scientist. And so she felt, you know, this knowledge, this approach that I have will be important uh, for the uh, population to establish trust. And at present, she has an 83% approval rating wow. in the population. Now, you can see at this point that it's uh, getting a little bit more difficult mm. because in her address to Parliament yesterday, she was very clear and clearer than she would usually be that she is not quite happy how some of the leaders in the lender, as we call it, are opening, uh, how quickly they are opening uh, the uh, businesses, etc. So she, again, as a scientist, is more skeptical and very atypical for her. She's actually saying that to the whole population, to the parliament. So we will see how it plays out uh, uh, in the future and uh, how Germany will fare. At present, the flattening of the curve is not as good as we would like it to be. And uh, I think there's got to be a bit more thinking, particularly at the decentralized level. Uh, back in India also, there's a lot of debate. Uh, the strict lockdown, which is still in place till the 3rd of May. There are guidelines that come out every day, standard operating procedures. Now the latest one is that standalone shops couldn't possibly start opening, uh, not the malls, not the markets. I don't know how closely you've been following uh, India's developments in India. Uh, I do know that you did, did grow up in, in Chennai. It was probably called Madras then when your father yes, was exactly, a good yeah. man. <laughs> but uh, how do you look at uh, the, if, if you can call it a debate, of lives versus livelihood or the balance between the two? Well, that balance is so different in different countries. I mean, yeah. if I take Germany, Germany, an incredibly rich country who, you know, within days was able to free money uh, for all kinds of professions to help people stay in their jobs, etc. That's a totally different situation in a country like India, of course, where a lot of livelihood is day laborers, is people running, you know, uh, very small businesses, are the markets, particularly the women uh, who run the markets and the little shops there. So it's very difficult to compare what we're seeing because we don't know that much about the virus. We're seeing that many countries are experimenting. And you will know that Mike Ryan, in one of his famous interviews, the head of the emergency program of WHO said, act fast, don't wait to be perfect. And I think it's very difficult for all of us in every country to deal with that. Uncertainty is the thing we all hate most. But what you're also indicating, no matter what the government does, you cannot run this crisis, you cannot respond to the crises without really involving your communities, without really involving your population, without, you know, you need to inform them. And this taking us back to Angela Merkel, she was always very open. She said, we don't know this, we don't know that, we might need to do this, etc. And therefore, trust in your government is going to be the essential thing so that people will adapt their behavior wherever possible, and uh, and therefore help flatten the curve. Professor Kikbush, when you're talking about, um, say, the time is to act now and not wait for perfection, when you're talking about, say, the virus development, we've seen so many reports of uh, already human trials starting, or maybe up to 60, 600 different cases around the world of uh, attempts to develop a vaccine. What about the ethics of that? H how does that work when there's such a need for the vaccine to be developed? 
Well, there are clear rules for vaccine development, also established by the World Health Organization. Uh, there is now, of course, an attempt to shorten the time frame uh, between, you know, the testing, the human testing, uh, the testing of the efficacy, etc. So what one is trying to do now is to shorten those time frames. Usually those are time frames of one to two years. There's also, of course, the question of the volunteers that one would get to be vaccinated. Already people have volunteered to do that in different parts of the world. But then, of course, you have to see how representative those volunteers yes. are, etc. It's an enormous measure. And, uh, of course, uh, WHO is very, very clear that the ethical uh, guidelines that it has established, that it has adapted for greater speed. When I, when, when I say adapted, it doesn't mean, you know, less rights for people, yeah. but it's the time frame and the amount of tests that you need. So I think it'll be very important to keep our eyes on this, also because uh, different countries approach this differently. And, you know, we have... Uh, science developments all around the world. And again, if we're talking of evaluation, if we're talking about accountability, the way uh, then vaccine trials will be conducted will be part of that as well. And it will be very, very important to have that. And the same, by the way, goes for other things, you know, digital tracing uh, and measures like that. We are confronted with new ethical and human rights issues, also the lockdowns. Uh, in this pandemic that we haven't had to deal with before. And I think it's so important that human rights advocates look very closely at this and then give reports. You earlier mentioned immunization programs uh, that was in relation to uh, the US probably uh, pulling back on halting its funding of the WHO. I know the focus of the world is on this pandemic and how to deal with it and possibly getting a vaccine in, like you're saying, 12 to 18 months. But what about malaria? What about tuberculosis? What about Ebola, which uh, cases we are seeing reports of uh, resurfacing in Africa as well? Is the focus uh, shifting away from that? I mean, just to put it in perspective, if I have my numbers correct, about 1,700 people a day die of tuberculosis in India. Whereas uh, when it's coronavirus at this moment, we have a total death count of about 700. Well, first of all, to get to your last uh, point, we don't quite know. And I think uh, the other important thing about the death rates is that actually it seems the virus also supports people with preconditions to die earlier. So you're getting a combination. We don't quite know what it means if a TB person is infected yeah. with the coronavirus. So uh, we, we get those developments and we do know that a whole range of deaths of other diseases were probably pushed, if I might say that, by an infection with the coronavirus. So that's one point. The other point is you're totally correct. We have that all the time. The minute there's a pandemic, all other diseases disappear into the depth of time. We've had that with Ebola. Remember all the dreadful reports where people could not go to hospital anymore, where mothers could not deliver their children in safety, etc. And we're experiencing this now as well, also for non-communicable diseases, I might add. And Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, has raised um, a big concern that uh, the vaccination of children where they've progressed so well is really in danger now. On the other hand, if I might add that, some of the structures and processes that programs, I'm thinking particularly of India and tuberculosis and diagnosis, etc., that have been established for some of these other diseases, Ebola is also a case in point, polio in particular, those infrastructures, but also the community workers who supported that, they are now an incredible resource to help us track and trace uh, for this uh, new outbreak. So we've got to start thinking, you know, these diseases together, their infrastructures together. And of course, quite honestly, that's the biggest argument we can have to establish primary healthcare systems and universal health coverage. Professor Ilona, 
Kickbosh, it was an absolute pleasure getting into your head and getting your perspective. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I do hope that once this lockdown is over, maybe you can revisit Chennai and India and we could meet you in person as well. I already had planned to do so and had to move it. So because I still have friends there. So thank you very, very much. And uh, yes, let's hope India is able to deal with this uh, well. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Stay safe.